First off, thank you to everyone who came to the presentation. My name is Cole Tarango, and the topic I decided to discuss on today was just war theory. And if you aren't familiar with just war theory, it's basically the idea that war can be, or can war be justified? And if so, how can it be? So with the history aspect of this, I wanted to really touch on like why we got into the war or like why the war was being fought. So for World War II, I said it was built on retaliation from when we got bombed at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. And with World War II, we did not know much about, or we didn't know at all about the concentration camps that was happening during the time. It was actually found midway through World War II. And so it was, that wasn't the case of why we got brought into the war. It was, just ba it was really based on retaliation. And then everyone started declaring war on each other after we declared war on Japan. For the Civil War, um, a lot of scholars and university professors claim that it was based off of states' rights and the, um, the difference between national government and states' government. And to me and to a lot of us here, I th we all believe that it was based off slavery, which to me is a greater evil than states' rights because the mistreatment of a, uh, mistreatment of a human being is much worse than states' rights states' rights just because of their skin color or ethnicity. So when it comes to those two topics, I think states' rights can be, cannot be as justified as, it, as racism and the, based, and the war based on slavery. For the Israel and Palestine conflict, it was based, it's a war that we see today, and it is basically these two sides have hated each other for centuries and thousands of years. And is basically Hamas and Palestine, they believe that um, the land that Israel has, it's, it's dedicated to them and they believe that they should have it. And Israel is being, is, believes that the, it is theirs and they are trying to defect their, or defend their homeland. And for Israel, it's not like it's back in the biblical days where they are commanded by God to fight these wars, it is basically based off self-defense and to protect their citizens. For tactics and strategies, I personally defined it as ways for one side to get closer to a common goal, in which this case it is to win the war. So for bombs, I wanted to focus on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For these two, these were dropped in two, the two cities in Japan and it was basically a way for the U.S. to try to end the war and to try to preserve U.S. innocent blood and life. But at, at the cost, it, was, it destroyed these two cities completely. It rubbished them, and it killed millions of Japanese civilians. But for the U.S.'s case, it did help them win the war. For suicides, kamikazes, and I believe it's called istashad, kamikazes is where the is where the, during the war, the, I believe it was the Japanese fighter pilots, they, they, they killed themselves through the planes, they crashed into wherever they went. And then Ishisad is where, in the extremist organizations in the Middle East, it is where they kill themselves in order for them to try to help their cause. And they kind of take, not the easy way out, but they sacrifice, they would like to look at themselves at as, as a martyr for their uh, religion. And so in that case, it's kind of like where, where, um, where is the ethical or moral, like, kind of, there's kind of a problem in that when you're taking a bunch of other lives at the expense of yours. For uniforms, and I put under that, it says Middle East, because in the Middle East, a lot of times you see that extremist organizations, and, and in this case also Hamas, they don't like to wear uniforms. And it's kind of just to blend in with the civilians and they put those lives at risk instead of their own because it helps them disguise themselves. And so it's, it's like as if I'm a U.S. soldier, it's like if I'm trying to distinguish between who's good and who's bad, I can't tell based off their look, if, like as if they're wearing you know, a uniform. I have to basically shoot if I'm being sh uh, shot at. And so it kind of delays that process if I'm trying to distinguish who's good and who's bad. For the effects of war, post-traumatic stress disorder, also PTSD, 
Yeah, I define or uh, one of the organizations on my research paper defined it as a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event or a series of events or a set of circumstances. Um, a lot of we see veterans all the time. They come back from war. It's hard for them to process what is happening in the normal society. And I have a couple of statistics from the U.S. Department of Affairs at the National Center for PTSD. And this is for veterans at some point of their lives, and it only includes ones that are still alive and during the time of the study, and it's not counting the ones who have already died. So during Iraq, it was 29%. The Persian Gulf War is 21%. Vietnam, 10%. And World War II is 3%. And the reason it's just declining is because less of these veterans are still alive today. And during the time of the research, it's just hard to get that information. And for these patients or veterans, it's almost like they're still in this war mode, as Mr. Bass described it in our interview. It's hard for them to be able to function in society today because all they know is to kind of like try to fight for the people around them and to, to, yeah, to try to save their lives and to save the people around them. For physical and cultural effects, families, the effects of PTSD can have heavy effects on a family. It can lead to abuse, divorce, and just amounts of problems that we see in especially not only America, but worldwide, that people just, it's hard for them to be able to just function even in their own families. For cities and communities, uh, I'm going back to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki point where when these bombs were dropped, it, it turned these cities into basically nothing. It is all ruins and it's just, it's kind of like these cities have to start over from where they began in the first place. In these communities, um, the the people in, within those communities, it's kind of like they have the choice to either be affected by what has happened to them, or to come together, or and to thrive and to be able to look positively on what has happened and to build up from where they left off. For biblical evidence, I put these two verses. I they're kind of contradictory. But at the same time, they kind of relate. So in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just, I have, just as I have loved you. You are also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. For this, it's kind of um, the point. It's kind of opposite of war. It's telling us that um, through this, we have to love those who are across from us. And in war, it's kind of, the way if we look at the enemy across from us, it's just kind of have that love and it's, it's, um, it's never mind. It's, it's kind of going against war because we're told to love one another. But in Ecclesiastes 3 8, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So through this verse, it does recognize the, that war will happen and that it, acknowledges the fact that that we are a fallen society because of sin and that the that there will be a time but back then it was different because uh the jewish nation was commanded under god and today we don't see as much of that because it, it it's not what it used to be closing thoughts so the big question is so can war be justified to myself i think or through all of the interviews, we all agree that war is ugly, but war is, is reality. It's going to happen because of our sin nature. But um, at the same time, I feel like definitely back in the biblical days, it can be justified if, uh, since it was commanded by God's holiness and they fought for God's holiness. But in today's reality, it, it can be justified. It's just hard to find those circumstances because it's just, it's today, it's, there's not much to go off of, like, that God told us to do whatever it is. Thanks. All right. And so, um, so I want to open it up, first of all, to all of our guests. Uh, if you've got any questions or feedback, um, if you got any questions or feedback for Cole, uh, feel free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I like this. I can go first if I need to. I was gonna. <laughs> All right, I'll open it up. Um, so, Cole, first of all, great job tackling and impossible. Um, like there, like you said, there's no, there's no getting around the fact that we live in a war torn world, right? Um, and so to try to tackle a question of whether or not it's ever justified something that terrible, um, it's it's not an easy question to answer. And I'm always impressed. Like like there are there are a lot of these projects that answer. I don't I don't mean to be mean because now I'm not trying to make any of y'all second guess your topics. A lot of the questions that y'all are asking are somewhat easier to ask, much less to answer. This is a this is a impossible question because it's a terrible. Uh, it's almost like I'm afraid of what the answer might be, right? Anyhow, so so all I'm saying is good job. I appreciate your your courage to do that. Um, you when you got to the conversation about um, when you brought in Bible verses, and you you discussed quite a bit of biblical stuff in your in your paper because um, there's a lot of war in the Bible. Um, yeah, so. The commandment to love, like there's this overarching commandment of love, loving God, loving your neighbor, um, what Jesus says here. Um, but the opposite, and this and this is where you kind of like hit a speed bump in the whole thing, the opposite of love isn't necessarily war. So here's my question, and, and it's one of those open-ended questions, feel free to think through. Um, is, is war inherently hate-filled? Meaning... Yeah, hate is a terrible thing, and I think there's I think there's biblical evidence that's that's what makes murder murder, right? Like Jesus said, you haven't killed anybody, but hate in your heart makes you guilty of such. So, is war um, inherently hateful? I I don't think so. Just because if you look at like the Civil War, for instance, brothers had to fight against brothers, and families had to go against each other just because of where they lived and. Inherently, you don't hate one another. You're just fighting for that cause that you believe in, and maybe they believe in that other cause. So it's really, it's not based on hatred and love. I think it's just a belief, what you're fighting for, like you're fighting for what you believe in. And whether that's the family member standing across you or someone you don't even know, I, it, it's just something you believe in. So and that's all it is. What is, in your research, and I think it's not what I'm doing, where would you draw the line for what is a just war? Like, I think you did a really good job looking at history of war. Like, some of the things that, in retrospect, it's very easy for us to say that was a just war because concentration camps were not the motivation for them. But, but for you, if you were to talk to legislators, presidents, people that sign sign papers or send troops, where where would you say like there this is the line? I would say the line is past where it can be handled diplomatically and it is the matter of it's all about to me or not all about, but a major part is the innocent blood and innocent lives at stake and whether those can be preserved and whether they're Christians or not I believe that just saving these lives is a greater purpose than like some like the Israel Palestine conflict. It's it's over land, and I know it's it used to be God's holy land or just whatever it used to be. But I think the line is around there. So, so to that point, can you define a little bit for us, like what when you say innocent life? What do you mean by that? Just people As that are to... people that are caught in the crossfire. Uh-huh. Just just kind of bystanders, just kind of a part of the process that they didn't need to be a part of the war, but they just happen to be another number if they are part of it. You say they need to be a part of the war. Is there is there a difference between so like in my mind that's not what the war, that's not what innocent means. I, I, like I, I get what you're saying. Like they're mm-hmm. just kind of they're not wrapped up in yeah. this. As opposed to a soldier, like do soldiers are they implicit just because they like, did they choose to be there, and therefore it's free? They're they're free game. You, you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Can you distinguish that a little. Like, what makes 
I'm trying to use, I'm trying to, do, I've read the paper, so I'm like, I'm trying not to say what you've said, but I'm trying to pull out, like, what makes the difference between this is fair game and this is not, or this person is fair game and this person is not. Do you mind if I sit on that question for a little bit? Sure. of it in the sense of was it the act of pulling the trigger or was it essentially the idea of like collateral damage like was it enemy on enemy back and forth or was it the aspect of like you said the innocent and it just didn't get caught up on the outside of it I didn't do too much research research on the causation but by the definition, I think it's just the whole process because in here it says experience or witness traumatic events or just even the circumstance of being in war and just that mindset. It's just kind of like just the thought process of being there and just it's a lot of stress inducing. So it's like, yeah, I think it's just the overall mindset and just the experiences. And going back to your question, um, I think it's a lot about motive and why you're fighting the war. And I think if you're fighting the war for the wrong reasons, uh, I think that's when it becomes the difference between innocent and not innocent. supposed to be just the removed from this whatever war is war there's what's called the doctrine of double effect like hey we're not intending to kill civilians or, or non-combatants but we understand when we bomb the factory this is yeah. going to be collateral damage and so you're always doing this kind of like calculus basically um did you see so this is a multi-part question Did you see in, in your research like the distinction between what justifies people, people or states or sovereignty or nations like going to war versus what justifies their conduct in war? Because typically there's also a distinction there. Did you see anything like that? That's not on the top of my head. Because I think to, to your answer to this type of question, like, it's Mr. Chadwick's original thing. It's an impossible question to answer. People have been working through this for 2,000 years. Christians have been working through this for 2,000 years. Just working in hands and saying yes or no. Like, if it's just a matter of find the right biblical evidence, that would be great, but it's not that. Like, with this later on, we're in the exact same like, series of speeches where Jesus says in John, have love for one another, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. In John 15, he says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for his friends. So, like, I'm going to fight as a soldier for my brothers and for my country, lay down my life for my friends. And Jesus said that nobody can have greater love than that. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's this impossible question to answer and seems to be the, the implication of just war theory is, like, hey, we're going to put up all these criteria to make, like, you have to satisfy all these criteria to make war justified. And it's going to be incredibly difficult mm -hmm. for you to satisfy all but supposing that you do, supposing like that you have a good cause, the Japanese burn, bombed Pearl Harbor. Now we have a good cause. Okay, you're justified in going to war. Or are you justified in what you're doing in the war? So as a, anytime someone presents on this, we get like asked if they think that the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was justified. I think I did. I think I did touch on that in the paper. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it kind of goes. I think I disagreed that it was justified in the paper. I forget my total reasoning, but it, the just the gist is kind of just the lot the amounts of human life. It doesn't. Is that really what needed to happen in order for the war to end? Okay. Um, and then to Pastor Nathan's question, like. 
there is no view from nowhere. So like God is not coming down from heaven to tell us, hey, this boy is justified. Mm-hmm. Have at it. Because we're not, we are not, nor is modern day Israel the biblical Israel. Mm-hmm. Like, there is no revelatory experience like, hey, this boy is justified, that boy is not. Or even after the fact to say, this one was good, that one isn't. So, how do we go about this? Like, what is, like, who is it that's going to be able to draw these lines and, and say, yes, no, you can do it, you can't do it, if you do it uh, unjustly, uh, you didn't have a just cause, you acted uh, unjustly within the war, like, who, how do we punish institutions and nations for doing this? That's a good question. Um, I think it was either in PC's interview or Pastor Nathan's or maybe one of the others. It, they brought up the topic that uh, that God, and he puts the people in power, he places them in power for a reason. And and I think that, and, going, and I know in Pastor Nathan's interview, it's a lot of between individual and systematic violence and and. Mr. Satterfield brought up the question, whose job is it to take these lives in war? Is it our job? Because how much better are we than the people across from us? And so it's a hard question. I, I don't really. Who punishes Hamas for war crimes? Who punishes Israel for war crimes? Nobody? Like we just were talking about it on Twitter or whatever. That's a good question. I didn't do research on that. So, so back to my original, and this is this is what I was talking about. Like back to my original comment was like, don't think so, I'm still waiting. Um, <laughs> back to my original comment, it's an impossible question, right? But to to something that Mr. Moore just said, and I think it's important that my students, like students, y'all y'all hear me out about this. This is one of the cool things about being a Christian. The people who have spoken deeply about this and who have thought the most about it are Christians. Don't get me wrong. Christians are guilty of war crimes. Like we have entire periods of of Christian history where Christians went to war and it was very unjust. Very unjust. Most of the people, like Cole brought up the Civil War, um, you understand if uh, about, about... a third of that equation was a bunch of Christians who were fighting as much to keep slavery as to get rid of it. People who claim the name of Christ, fighting to keep it as much to get rid of it. And that's something that makes Christians wildly uncomfortable. So is that just war? Like, okay, bottom line is this. All of this consideration, I think, drives us to the fact that um, what justifies going to war is... Is, is a deeply difficult and impossible question. Um, and therefore, as we vote, as we act as citizens, as we do active military service, you know, or whatever it may be, um, I think it goes from the individual to the society. Like, you're not going to have, if you have a bunch of individuals who are, um, who are going to war for, honorific reason, for, for good reason, for the best reason, you may still have a president who's guiding that military for the worst re- reason possible. And that's what makes it even more complicated, is that you have you have good people fighting terrible wars. That, that makes it that much more complicated, right? That's why I thought the, the PTSD element was super important, because um, I mean, we, the, the numbers in terms of World War II, like going lower and lower, I, I don't know, they didn't, they didn't talk about stuff like that. You know, Vietnam, all these guys came back from Vietnam and nobody knew what PTSD was. Mental health, like these guys weren't discussing that. They sure enough, they, they, they had it. <laughs> they, they were going through it. And and so then it becomes a question. So so Mr. Moore talked about um, Augustine. Aquinas was the whole like pre, pre-bellum, uh, mid-bellum, post-bellum, like the, the idea being not only is there a question of what to do what injures a person to war justly? There's a question of what you're doing. Yeah, like the whole Nero, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki thing. It's like, okay, one city, but two? Two cities? Eh. Um, but then there's also a question of post 
There's, there's also the question of what do we do after the war? I mean, who, who cleans up after that, right? What do we do with these soldiers when they come back home? Um, I think Cole's project is valuable just because, if for no other reason, it, when, I, I'll put it this way, and then, and then don't, don't forget what you're, what you're going to say. Um, when Israel and Palestine, or when, when Israel went after Hamas recently, like just a few weeks ago, do you all remember this? I walked into school that Monday. It happened over a weekend. I walked into school that Monday, and three times before lunch, I had a student ask me which side I was on. Three times before lunch, I had a teenager ask me what side I was on, and all three times, they assumed they knew. They assumed, well, his Bible teacher, two of them, his Bible teacher, of course, is on Israel's side. And then a third said, well, of course, you're, you're, not, you're not with the oppressor. You're not with this big military state of Israel. You're, I mean, look at these Palestinians. So, so two mistakes I see. Number one, assuming that there's a clear side to be on. Are y'all hearing me on this one? One, big mistake, assuming that there is a clear side that a Christian ought to be on. I'm just letting you know, what Cole said, that, that conflict is thousands of years old. The United States, there's nobody in the, the United States has been around for, for a, a quarter of a millennium. Like, we just haven't been around long enough, right? So for a teenager in the United States of America to understand what the nature of this conflict is, I'm sorry, we're all lost on this one, right? So number one, the mistake that there is a clear side again. Number two, to look at someone and assume what side they're going to be on in something this complicated, that's... That's what I, so sorry to get all preachy all of a sudden, but, but like that's what that's what I love about this. Um, the, the more you think about it, the less confident you are on what side you think you're on. So so live in that tension. Well, well, well. I was going to ask Coach Moore the question of, um, it's kind of what you just said, like whose job is it to punish? Do you think it's a physical or more of a spiritual? Like do you think it's God's job to punish those who have wronged and, his eyes, or do you think it's more like you said, like physical standpoint? Who's legally whose job is it? I think that God can, I don't know, will judge the, the living and the dead at the end of the age, and that's comforting in some sort of like eschatological big picture sense. But it's not comforting in the sense that like Israel's, it, oh, sorry, like come on, pick your side, right? <laughs> they don't pick a side, but yeah. pick your side. <laughs> That Israel's getting killed forty thousand children. <laughs> like, like it doesn't it doesn't come from me that like forty thousand Palestinian children are dead currently. And so like I but I don't know. Like I Bass asked me, Mr. Bass, excuse me, uh asked me, my good friend and mentor, Britton Bass, uh asked me in the midst of all this, like, so do you think war can ever be justified? And I was like, yes. The problem is like I don't know if we have the clarity, yeah. the moral clarity in, in like proposing to go to war to say we are justified in doing this because everybody who's ever fought in a war thought they were justified in doing it. Yeah. And like, who is it that's like the neutral observer that's purely objective that can say right or wrong, Switzerland? Like, I don't know who it is, and I don't know if it has to be an institution who physically, like, steps in and does this, because that's scary, mm -hmm. that you get that much power to the UN, or the, 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 the same problem, just different level. Right? Exactly. So, so two, two things to that. Number, number one, um, the, one, of the, one of the things that Aquinas talks about a lot, and all of his rules of engagement and all that stuff, like him, him discussing, is like, yeah, the, the number of things that you've got to do in order to be justified to go to war is terribly difficult. Therefore, it probably shouldn't happen that often. Like, that was, that was one of his strong conclusions, is like, it's so hard to justify war, so we probably shouldn't be doing it, if at all possible. Like, that's one of the major contributions Christian thought had, is like, yeah, it might be justified, but you, you better be real. And, and to, to, if you don't mind me, throw my two cents into that question, it's like a lot of times I think war is the judgment. Like talking about God judging, a lot of times like when, a lot of times it's like, you know, when when Israel asked for a king, they didn't know what they were asking for. They wanted what everybody else had, 
And it's like, well, they got kings. We want a king. And God's probably sitting among the divine council thinking, oh, no. <laughs> they have no idea what, what's about to Like, just getting a king, that means this dude's ego and this dude's ego is going to clash and they're going to get involved in stuff just because these guys don't like each other. Mm -hmm. And so God says, you know what? Let them have it, right? Like, a lot of times war is the judgment. It's like, okay, these two people are, are the, these two nations are just not honoring and they're being unjust. So let them have it. Right, sorry. Um, not sorry. Uh, students, we got a couple minutes here. Classmates, friends, family, countrymen. Yes, sir, Sam. Um, what do you think, like, like, a Christian's role is in, like, physically carrying out, like, violence in a war? Like, do you think, like, going back to the verse in John, I think it was, like, do you think that it's okay for a Christian to like, be in a war and like, basically just like, kill another person just like, based on the belief? Like, what do you think their role is? There is a, um, there's a movie that PC recommended me to watch. The, I forget how to pronounce it. The, oh, no thank you. And it's basically, he told me that there's this ceasefire and these two Christian like they're both sides are Christian. They meet up with the past or priests and they have, uh, I believe it was dinner together or something. And it's like, it's the same question. Like how can these two sides go back to killing when they know there's another Christian on the other side? And I don't really know how to be honest. I mean, it's like you have the moral duty, I believe to not kill another Christian, but at the same time you enlisted in whatever you listed on in the war, so I don't know if it's going against your belief or not. So that's all I got. Well, you said uh, you're a human, not God, not justified, right? Yeah. If, if they didn't do the bombs, then the U.S. would walk in and they come to get bombs to defend. It's like, you're going to do whatever you can to defend your nation. But there's an argument that, like, if they didn't do that, those American and Japanese possibly more alive. I think when it becomes out of hand with man on man combat and it's more of you're dropping bombs from however high in the sky and you're dropping it on the other t other side it's like it's almost like man versus computer in a sense and it's like you're going to take the risk out of your side and you're going to inflict the destruction on the other side, so that's kind of that side. Yeah. There's, there's a whole sorry. There's a whole other element of this that it's like, and especially these days when we're in an age of drones, and now it's like um, the violence. We have the technology to remove the violence farther and farther away from us. I mean, this goes all the way back to longbows. I mean, for for a while there, bow and arrow was considered a very unethical thing. Because look at how far away you can kill somebody. You know, you need to march down that field. You need to look them in the eye. You're a real man. Like a man. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then it became an issue of, whoa, you're going to hide in the woods and kill somebody? That's just, that's a cowardly way. And then it's like snipers. It's like, well, the, so we're moving far and then dropping bombs. And now we've got drones where we don't even have to be on the same side of the planet, right? Like there's this tendency to want to move the violence farther and farther away. And when we do so, I think it's what Paul was, what was getting at. When we do so, it's like it gets a little easier to sleep at night, regardless of how much, uh, you know, concomitant violence we've just thought of. So, yeah, more more complications. Uh, Bush, what do you think? Um, you talked about the whole idea of the, the innocence of the man versus the, the innocence of the culture. They've never really touched on that point in the graph. So, what do you think about the fact that there are I like how the hardest question for me to answer is from another student. So part let of me, the art, let me, let me, this may help you out, and it will give you some time. Part of the art of coming to a good opinion about something is not necessarily having a solid answer, 
as much as it is, what are the things we need to consider in order to answer that question? So I, I don't think I, it'd be unfair for you to answer like, this is the debate we've been having for 2,000 years, right? So rather than trying, and, it, and by the way, this is coaching on not just answering good question and answer, but like coming to a solid opinion a lot of times doesn't look like falling on a solid answer. But it does, it does at least need to involve identifying what you need to be thinking about in order to come to a solid answer. Okay, so we're not looking for a solid answer, but it's just like, yeah, man, if, if you got people, there were two parts to that, right? People fighting, is, is it right for you to go to war or have to be or are forced to go to war for a cause you don't believe in? Um, and the second part of it is, does that mean that this person who doesn't even believe in this cause, they're just they're here, here against their will, doesn't, does that make them an innocent in all of this? Well, in, in war, you know, it's not only soldiers. You have different roles within that. So, I mean, you're not, if you get drafted, you're not guaranteed to, like, be on the front lines or whatever. You could be, you could help out in a different way in order even if you don't believe in the cause, there's people around you who influence you during that, and you might have your uh, view changed. So you're not always doing the killing. You're helping out your team in order for them to reach their greater goal. <laughs> say you are what? Like, say it's one guy. To kill the guy who doesn't believe in their own yeah. cause. Yeah, because he's wearing a uniform. So well, then that gets in the conversation of that kind of gets into the conversation of self-defense, and that's kind of it's almost like the retaliation type thing, like you're defending yourself. So that gets into that conversation, in my opinion. I think some of that comes down to rules and Mm-hmm. citizens into military service. This is this one of the reasons why the United States has always strived to have a volunteer military service, that you choose to, to fight in these wars. And only a few times have we ever gone to that terrible place of drafting soldiers. This is the type of thing that you need to take away from it, where when you hear Warhawk type politicians say, hey, vote for me. And these are the types of questions that you would want to think about. These, these are the types of things you would want their opinion on, because this is that that's what would make forced military service a pretty terrible thing. Okay. Um, in support of the whole military being drafted, for these officers like actively deploying, uh, they can still support from behind the lines, like with certain people in town. So like, if you're supporting a different role in town, so like you said, like your bias against change. Does that still make you innocent because you're still supporting and aiding in an unjust war? I don't have it up, but I kind of, that's, I feel like that's kind of the whole overarching thing that it's all about your reasoning. And if your heart's in the right place, it's just kind of, it doesn't justify you necessarily, but it's just kind of like, it's kind of, it kind of, I, I guess the word is justified. It's like if you have like a reason to be able to help out and if you like physically if you can but you want to, it's it's all about reasoning in my opinion, like why you're doing it. Like there's no split like I understand what you're saying, but there's no split to make you innocent. Like as soon as you start helping out and aiding in that deal, whether it's like being a cooker or it's like 
does, are you any longer like an innocent or are you an active supporter? I would probably say active supporter because even like you're you're supplying the front lines with the bullets that they're going to be using, or you're if you're a medic, you're saving those people on the front lines in order potentially for them to go back out and keep fighting for your side. So, I'm not trying to mess up everybody's day thinking about war first thing in the morning, but any other any other questions or thoughts? Cool. Thank you, Cole. Yeah, I'm going to end this.